understand the biology is the basic of good beekeeping. And much of the things which I talked before on, uh, with regard to selection and um, local adaptation and especially varroa treatment is based on some ideas which I would like to share with you right now. So we talk about vitality and, and, and health in, in nature in general. And there are some general rules and aspects. So I start with this nice tree standing on rocks on an island in Croatia where it's extremely hot and dry in summer. And when you stand in front, you say, well, how is it this tree managing to survive under such environmental conditions? And there are some general rules which later will be explained also for the bees. But first thing is there is the need to explore resources. It has to get nutrition, it has to get water, it has to get, build up energy. So you have to explore the resources you're living from. Then next aspect is there is an inner balance. You can imagine there are roots deep in, in, in the stones which are, where it's cold, where, but there's water and nutrition available. And there's the sun shining and, and photosynthesis is going on in the leaves. So somehow this has to be balanced. And there are many hormones in the game, for example. And then the next aspect is successful reproduction. Without reproduction, uh, uh, species can survive. <coughs> And then, most interesting, resisting diseases, parasites, and stress. We often have the feeling there is a new disease, so a completely new challenge. Nothing is new on Earth. I mean, the whole evolution happened in competition of species. So you always have to fight with your enemies, and you have to develop your resistance strategies, otherwise you can't survive. And if you don't survive, then there is one terrible rule, no mercy with the weak. So the nature is very hard. So who can't manage in a certain environment to survive will just die out. So what does it mean for bees? Exploring resources. Bees developed fantastic ways to communicate with each other. This is the basis of this social life in, in bee colonies, which makes them so successful throughout the world. And exploring resources has also something to do with the nesting site. Where can I go? Where can I settle with my colony to have a good future then? In a balance, take the nest organization. So there's a very clear structure inside the nest, which plays an important role to keep, to keep the balance, to keep them held, to have an optimal fruit production and so on. It has something to do, for example, with temperature control and regulation of relative humidity inside the hive. And then when it comes to reproduction, we are faced with one of the most interesting mating biology we find in, in, in uh, nature in general. And this is warming behavior is an interesting aspect. So what it means in detail, I will explain in a minute. And there is, in fact, a lot of behaviors and a lot of strategies to fight diseases and to resist parasites and certain stress. And especially one mechanism, which many of us are not so well aware about, is what I call compensation. And I will explain in a few minutes what is meant by this. So this is part of the repertoire. It's not the, f the full list, but it's some really basic things I would like to uh, discuss now in more details and show you how it, this relates to certain diseases and to our options to keep healthy and vital bees. Communication. So there is this waggle dance, which you all know, and which is fantastic to observe, a good study object for, for children to, to understand how social organisms act. And in fact, these bees can tell the, the direction and the distance of what they are looking for. And bees are using this also when it comes to the, to, to the swarming process. So weeks before swarming, the first uh, <coughs> scout bees go out searching for proper nest sites. And there is communication then among scouts. And at the end, it's like a democratic process. That, all the scouts have to be convinced that the choice which is done is, is the best one. And then the swarm can go out and, and leave for this position. Uh, 
So this plays a very important role beside the, the dance languages and we have this for, for grooming, we have this um, for food sources, as I said, but there's <coughs> uh, more reactions on the dance level and even more important is the communication with pheromones, which is very well developed in hives and which helps bees, for example, to detect uh, disease brood cells and to open them and to clean them. We come back to this later. So, and then the inner organization. We have these nests. Our bees, Apis mellifera, the European honeybees, and Apis serrana, the Asian honeybees, are the two bee species which depend on an outer nest wall. So. Uh, they, they have to find a suitable uh, place and here in our region it was usually hollow trees. Nowadays it's more the, the buildings which they find. And what is characteristic for the nest is that you have parallel combs. And this has something to do with the uh, optimization of, of uh, uh, temperature and humidity con conditions inside the hive. And this is how it probably looked like in a more natural situation. Nowadays we have hives and we discuss a lot about the hives and there are differences, so it's, I think it's really an important discussion to build a hive which is uh, suitable for bees. Not all of them are. If you go down you see quite different types. I'm not going to argue on this right now, but uh, in fact you can start interesting discussions at that point. We should, we should recognize that these nests have a very clear inner structure and this is uh, very well described in the reports from Thomas Seeley. You had him here in the honey show as a, uh, uh, to, to give talks some years ago and probably he explained all this. I took this from one of his books. During his lifetime he studied so many natural nests that he could give a clear description and, and there are some typical characteristics. So the, the size of the nest shouldn't be too big. So bees prefer 25, 35 liters in a volume. If it's too small, they don't go in. The nest can't, couldn't develop, but if it's too big, they avoid it. They want to really cover the nest and to uh, uh, defend it to the outside. And for the defense, it's most suitable if there's just one limited entrance, and if it's too wide, they build uh, they make it smaller with propolis to be sure that they can control who is going in, who is going out. And from this entrance, you have the, the inner structure in that way that uh, the honey storage is so always going as far away from the entrance as possible. So in, in this case, it's going up. If you have a more flat nest, then it's going to the backside. And <clears throat> this is where they store the honey. And as you know, when there is a good honey flow, um, bees can't resist. So they will collect as much as they, as they get. And uh, the, in an extreme situation, they completely block their nest. That's a natural situation. And at that moment, of course, there is an increasing tendency then to swarm or they stop brood production because there's no, no space left. And so this automatically regulates the strength and if the nest gets weaker, then it can't store any more honey. Uh, but what is interesting, we distinguish between the brood chamber and the honey, ch honey uh, supers on top. Bees don't know this from the natural nest. Uh, it's always this wide contact area where the, where the heart of the nest with the brood and in the winter, the, the winter cluster is connected to open food just around. So this is very important. There should never be a long distance. Bees have to reach uh, uh, nectar and fresh pollen at any time. So this is how it develops and if the colony gets stronger, the, the nest is growing down till the end and then during winter when the bees follow the food and somewhere then cluster up here, wax moths are coming and mice are coming and they take out the old combs and next year the, the, the nest can develop on, on, on fresh combs. So this is a natural rhythm. We see the same with each comb which we take out in summertime. So be aware when, when you take out a comb and observe this always 
rounded or elliptic brood nest. It's always compact and it goes over several combs, so altogether it's like a ball. And this is the best shape you can give to keep it close together to ensure optimal ventilation, temporization, and, and also humidity control. This is what the bees do, and that is how it should look like. There's, uh, there should be pollen close by because this is needed to feed the brood, and then especially when the young bees emerge, they take up a lot of <coughs> pollen in the, in the first few days. So they have a growth of their birth weight by 50% within the first week. And this is mainly the pollen which they consume. So it has to be close by it all the time. There should never be a lack. And then there must be this cover of, of honey, open and sealed honey available. This is how it looks like in a healthy, healthy brood nest. And this is so important. I, I stress this here because when it comes to the, to the beekeeping books and, and you learn beekeeping, you find so many old tradition techniques which explain you how you have to to split the nest and put in empty combs at a certain time to uh, provide uh, the swarming and, and all these things. And this, this should, be, should be gone. The first rule is keep the nest in its natural order. And you can be sh quite sure that the bees know best how it should be organized. Don't disturb them too much. <clears throat> Mating biology, swarming behavior. Great field, till now not completely explored and understand what is really going on there. But there are some interesting, interesting facts. So first of all, if we don't regulate the production of worker on drone food and let the colonies build their own combs, then in May, June, the, the, uh, the main uh, propagation period of the year, colonies tend to build 30, 40 percent of the brooders' drones. We did measurements on, on strong colonies and they reared up to 35, 40,000 drones a year. It's amazing. So if you let them go, they spend so much of their energy in the drone production and a drone takes about double the amount of, of proteins and energy from, from the hive than a worker he does. So it's like crazy. And so if they produce, let me say, 20, 25,000 drones on average, on the other side, they may have a swarm, there may be exchange of queen at the end of the season, so a colony produces one or two queens a year. So we have a relation of one to 20,000. How many drones are needed to get a full mating of the queen under natural conditions? 20, excellent. Well informed people. 15 to 20 drones. This is a good average for open mating conditions with, with uh, good climatic conditions. So we had thousandfold this amount. For what reason? For what reason? You can answer first of all by yourself, and then afterwards we, we can compare the solutions. There's the next interesting thing. As you all know, drones develop from unfertilized eggs. The genetic consequence is they are haploid. Each gene is there's just one allele. That has a strong consequence. Many, many alleles uh, give negative effects on the hive. But with our diploid workers or queens, there's always a chance if you have a negative allele that the other one, which is coming from the other parent part, is positive. And those positive things are usually dominant. So female bees can carry a lot of negative genetic information without showing it. It's hide it. Drones can't hide. If there are any negative effects, they are expressed in the drones. So the drones are a great filter in the selection process to keep out negative things. Then there is this phenomenon of long mating distances. So it's regular going up to about seven kilometers. We know the queens do the longer distances. They like to, to go three, four, five kilometers from the nest 
to find the mating site. The drones prefer the closer drone congregation areas, but often they also go for two, three kilometers. So six, seven kilometers is quite normal. We know extreme values of more than 10 kilometers mating, mating distance. And this is amazing because it gives a high risk. The queen can be lost. It, it has to find the way back and, and all this. Why does the colony take this risk? So there must be some advantage of such a long mating uh, distance. And then it goes together with the fenumen of these drone congregation areas. And as we know by now, those drone congregation areas may occur at the same place year by year. So it's a certain marks in, in the field. But they are only stable if there is a minimum number of drones available to, to form such a congregation area. And we are speaking about 15, 20,000 drones. And we did uh, investigations on, on uh, drone congregation areas and sometimes found more than 30,000 drones at the same time in the air. And it's like a cloud. So it may be 200 meters long and the channel 50 meters wide, can be 30, can be 50, can be 70 meters high in the air, it depends on the climate and on the geographical structure around. It's usually about that, so you can't see it with your blank eyes, but if you walk through the field and you hear something like a swarm, take your glasses, check, maybe there's a drone congregation area. We go for such things with the balloons here and with the pheromone attractants, and then you can you find this out and, and can further study this. So, 25,000 drones in the air, which come from several kilometers around, means in the f from the functional side, you have a perfect mixture of all the colonies in the area which successfully rear drones. So they all participate <coughs> in the mating game. It's like the dancing event where all the bo boys go and meet and wait for these nice ladies turning up and then we can see who makes, makes the run. Exactly the same thing is going, is going on here. That means in the consequence, the surviving population of the surrounding is present there. And the queen gets the chance to meet with the most successful colonies in form of their drones, of the filtered genetic information from, from those colonies. And then finally, the queen gets multiple mated with 15 to 20 drones, which means she is not relying on a, on a single genetic information set, but she takes 15 or 20 as a good choice of the best from the best of the region. So what really can survive, which is vital in the region, is present then afterwards in the sperma seeker of a single queen. And the colony you are working on presents this rich genetic selection, designed and approved to be vital from the region. This is natural mating biology. It's, in fact, the most perfect mating system to select on vitality. And because it's so functional, it's worse for the colonies to spend so much energy in the drones who have this surplus of drones. And in fact, when it comes to a natural development, selection in honeybees mainly happens by the drone population. It's not the queens, it's not the single swarm which gets a chance to survive or not to survive. It's the drones. Selection is on the drones. And this is great, we can use this. Uh, but at the moment, we usually neglect it. We mix up our drone populations. We import queens from everywhere. Don't care if they are well adapted or not. We discussed on this local adaptation in one of the talks before. So this is one mistake. And when it comes to the breeders, the breeders want to have full control. So we are happy to inseminate queens. And sometimes we do it with a single drone because we know this is a, probably the best. But those drones never flew. There's no proof that they are really fit well to the surroundings. So, it makes sense to use such technique in well-defined breeding programs, for sure. But 
you have to be very, very careful. <clears throat> okay. We made an interesting mating experiment in 2005 on the island of Norderney. You know, in Germany, all the islands they use this isolated mating stations, and Norderney is in the hand of our institute. And at that time, we started to run what we call now this tolerance mating stations. So the idea is uh, we don't treat our drone colonies. We leave them one year without treatment against Varroa because we know when the rower goes into a drone cell, this drone probably won't get a chance to mate a queen. So it's the colonies themselves who have to show who is able, after one year without treatment, to produce healthy drones. And we want to give them a preference on such mating stations. But bef before we established this in a wider range, we had to test it. And this was in 2005. That was the first season where we did it on Northern Eye. And this is one of the biggest mating stations with last season about 3,000 queens mated there on the island. <clears throat> so what we did, we had 26 drone colonies. They were built up the year before and then left without treatment. And then when the season started, we had regular control of uh, colony development and uh, how many drones are there and uh, uh, what is about varroa infestation. And then we brought many queens to the island to get mated there. And then afterwards, with genetic methods, microsatellite technology at that time, we could study which queen got mated with which kind of drones. So we could relate it to specific colonies. I don't go to all the details, but the main findings from this is, first of all, after one year, there were huge infestation differences between the colonies. So we measured several times in, in, in June, July, bee samples, and we had between 0 0.2 and more than 8 mites per 10 comes of bees. So this is a very wide range developed by the colonies. There are, there are differences in the susceptibility. And then we could clearly show that with increasing varroa levels, the number of drones developed in the hive was going down. And we could show that the drones which got adult had a lower mating, uh, mating success in the higher infested colonies. And at the end, we had, when a drone mated, which came from a higher infested colonies, he had just a very small portion of descendants. So there's less sperm transfer to the queen. And <clears throat> uh, when we come to these final numbers, so we had a relation of up to 1 to 10 uh, regarding the number of descendants per drone colonies. And this was closely correlated with the row infestation. So higher infested colonies have a lower chance to mate in the field. In my first talk on, on Thursday, I reported about varroa resistance. And we see that in many spots where men didn't interfere, we meanwhile have resistant populations. So it was interesting to see that this can happen within just 10 years. And this is the reason behind. Because there's such a strong selection built in in the, in the, in the drone population, varroa has immediately a selective effect, and colonies which are more uh, resistant get a much better chance in the natural uh, uh, game of mating. OK, some more data from Tom Seeley. I'm a fan of him, and, and we exchange ideas and work uh, together. And this is uh, back to the, to the swarming. And, and in the swarming process, I showed you the pictures. The bee decide where to go. And what we know is colonies prefer to leave the location of the mother nest, so they don't go directly in the neighborhood, but they prefer to, to have some distance in between. So he, together with a student, made an interesting experiment, and it's published in Apidology. So this is why I cited here. You can refer to the article. And the situation was uh, they built up 24 colonies equal strengths as artificial swarms with young queens from a common source. And then they put 12 queens uh, in, in, in their colonies here in a normal apiary, let me say. It looks like this. Could be, could be your home apiary, probably. And then a few hundred meters aside, there was a, 
open bush area looking like this. And there they put 12 colonies individually, one here and one over here. So you see the dots on the map. And there was an average 70 meters dis distance between the highs. And then the experiment was built up in the first season with low varroa infestation, good feeding that all the colonies wintered well. And then in the following year, they studied how the colonies develop. They didn't interfere too much. They offered them space if, if they need more space for honey and so on, but no specific management. But what they did, they checked varroa population development. And this is reported in those graphs. And um, <coughs> there are the so-called crowded colonies, the 12 from the apiary in the upper row. And in the lower row, you have the dispersed colonies. And here on the axis, they give us natural mite mortality counted every two days. So how many mites drop down in two days? And you see the development over the season, lower infestation in spring, and then it goes up. We come back to the numbers in a, in a second. But I have to explain these three columns first. There were colonies swarming and some weren't swarming. So about 50% of the colonies swarmed. And what happened then is in those colonies here, they swarmed. And afterwards, the remaining colonies were not able to establish a young mated queen. It got lost on the mating flight, or they couldn't rear a queen successfully, whatever. But the consequence was those colonies were lost. Interestingly, it was a higher rate on, on the crowded place. So it makes it more difficult for the queens to return to the right hive. But this is less important for what we are discussing now, varroa infestation, uh, fight with diseases or parasites. You easily see that there is a big difference between the development here and the development here. Those colonies were swarming and replaced the old queen with the young queen uh, successfully, and those colonies were not swarming. And you see how much difference it makes. That has something to do with what I reported yesterday. When we come to more natural-like varroa treatment, we have to have a summer fruit interruption, as with natural swarming. This is the, the same effect we see here. But then again, if you compare here and here, you see there is quite a difference. And the infestation is not so much going up. The maximum here is about 500, if I see it right, yeah, near to 600 mites in two days, which is an enormous mite load, of course. But here it was more than 1,000. So it's less than, than half of it, just by the different position of the hives. And they went on with the experiment, not treating those hives. And what happened? They lost all those until December, early or later. And interestingly, all those colonies survived without treatment. Swarming colonies, separated from each other, did well. And that teaches us two important things. It's wise for swarms to leave the location of the mother nest and to have its own place. Bees like to have this, their own area where they forage and where they die with their parasites, if they die, without disturbing too much of the neighbor colonies. We put colonies together in an apiary. Of course, it should be effective. And sometimes it's 50 and 100 colonies in a place with professional beekeepers. What we achieve by this is that always the most diseased, most susceptible colony decides about the health level, the average health level of the apiary. We also always go for the, for the worst. We don't give the good ones a chance. So this is something about the management, which you can think of. And the second thing is the swarming effect when it comes to offend diseases, parasites, which are going to the brood. The brood interruption of a few weeks in summertime is a healing procedure. And nature has this always. Each colony which winters successfully and builds up a nice colony will swarm at least once a year. This is a normal biology of honeybees. We stop them. We prevent it. OK. And then hygiene, defense behavior, and these things, I reported on this on, on varroa resistance. It plays a very important role there. I don't go to the details right now again, but I would like to explain compensation behavior. And in fact, I do this with some data which are old in the meantime. It was one of the first trials we did when I, I came to Kirchheim. 
But I learned so much from this that I would like to share the findings with you. Uh, the background of the study was um, there was a technique developed to winter as many queens as possible with just a small amount of bees. And it worked very well when strong, healthy colonies were split up at the end of October, so when the first frost came. And we put then combs with the, with the stored uh, honey and healthy bees from these well-developed colonies in nukes with three and four combs. And we put them in non-isolated boxes, so to keep them cold, we introduced the queens, which were before kept in mating boxes, and that's how we wintered those colonies. And when then frost really starts, they were put one to each other, so like a block that they warm each other. And that way we had winter losses less than 10% in, in the population, and, and you could make three, four, five splits out of a strong colony and get five times the number of queens wintered. Excellent technique. But what was interesting, once those small units went successfully over the winter, they showed an enormous spring development. And very often, we got the same summer honey crop from those weak units compared to normal, normal sized colonies. And we were interested to study, what, how is it working? What is standing behind? So a student came. Ansgar Westerhoff, now one of the biggest beekeepers in Germany, meanwhile. And he ran this testing. And we said, well, you get splits, which we built at the end of October. And you get, for comparison, normal developed hives. And your job is to measure the number of brood cells and the number of bees in regular intervals to see the development. And he did this first then in November. This was a situation, 6th of November with about 3,500 bees on average in the nukes and about 12,000 bees in the normal hives. And then in early spring, when the first mild temperatures came up, he started again. And then every two or three weeks, he had to measure the colonies. And then I won't forget uh, the day in early. Uh, April, when he had the third time measured in, in spring, and he came in my office at the evening and he said, well, what did you tell me about the survival of these nukes? Shit, I will lose 90% of my hives. Most of them are already gone. There are just a few bees left. Phew, what is going on? We never had this before. It was a well-approved system. So we were lucky in the sense that we had additional nukes built like this at the same time, which we didn't touch before. So next day I went with him to those hives and they were all fine. Normal development as we knew it from all the years before. And then we went on with the experiment. He had his original nukes, but he also took some of, of these nukes, which we didn't touch until beginning of April. And he could go on with his measurements. And in fact, until mid of July, he found the, the situation that the nukes went up by 700% of the strength, while the normal colonies made 200%. So they were equal size at that time. And from all the data, we could clearly show what goes on. The fact is, if you have the, such a weak hive, the remaining bees do their very best to rear as much brood as possible. And what we have seen then in April in those units is that a single adult bee comes on four brood cells at the same time. One bee, four brood cells. They have to be cleaned, they have to be fed, they have to be warmed up, they have to forage at the same time, they have to defend the hive. It's unbelievable. One bee, four brood cells. When it comes to the normal hives, the maximum you will find at that period where colonies usually grow very quickly is one to two, one to 2.5 maybe for a few weeks, but then it's, they stop. So the interesting question is, why are those bees so lazy? <laughs> why don't they do what they should do? They have to work for us. Imagine a strong colony, wintered well, and then they rear one to four brood. Ah, you get 20 splits by May. That would be perfect. 
and we come with economical interests, we are looking, how can we stimulate them eh? to get more out? Why don't they do that? I give you a second to find your own answer before I will give the answer from the experiment. That was our shock, what I already reported. Losses. It looks small, but please take the scale. It's about percent. We lost one of our control hives because the queen was matched. Nothing. All, all developed well. We lost 76% uh, of the nukes in this experiment from the group which was measured in November, February, March. We didn't lose nukes from this later taken group. And this tells a story. With this one to four, the bees go to the edge of the biological potential. And there comes one additional drop into the barrel, and it starts to flow over. And this is what happens here. The difference between the, the two group of nukes was simply that we, in the 6th of November, then somewhere about the 10th of February and two times after, we opened to check how many bees are there and to measure the brood. It takes five minutes per nuke. Three times opening at not the best weather conditions was enough to kill three quarters of the population. And this is something which we do not really realize. I mean, we have tremendous honey yields nowadays. Beekeepers in our country calculate with 100 kilograms per hive and even more. So they take what they can get, and then they claim that there are colony losses. Do we ever think about what we expect from the bees to do? <coughs> and to answer the question, why don't bees use their potential? Of course they do. But they keep some reserve for the worst situation which may occur. And the bees which we got in our hands nowadays pass this 50 million years selection process. And you can be pretty sure once in 100 years there was a season where it's only honeydew, where you have a lot of nosema, where you have a very long winter, and whatever problems. All the parasites we know nowadays are not new designed. They were already there. And then it were the very best colonies, which still under these extreme situations could manage to survive. And they were the ones who passed on their genetic information. And there it's written in the genetic information, don't give the maximum of what you can give. Always save reserves. And this is a general principle in nature. We have the same with, with our own lives. I mean, we used to work 60 hours a week, and we are always under stress. And we can still improve, still improve, until we lay down. And we, yeah. So we can think about this. And bee, modern beekeeping is there in a very similar situation as, as uh, intensive farming is now all over. And this is something which we should keep in mind. OK. So um, when it comes now to better understanding of health, we have to be careful. Who is getting ill? Is it the single bee? Is it the colony? Is it the population? It's quite different aspects. And we have with these different levels different resistance mechanism. So if it comes to the single bee, there is a immune defense. Certain blood factors, certain blood cells, which play an important role when it comes to the defense of viruses, bacteria. And there are the infection barriers. So uh, the outer body and the uh, intestine, which, which couldn't, uh, shouldn't be damaged. So these are is protection of the single bees. And there already we can have disturbance. For example, with uh, pesticides, intake of pesticides, we know that something changes in the immune defense of the individual bee. So on the colony level, we have a much bigger block. And in fact, the most important resistant mechanisms are behavioral traits. 
like the defense, like the grooming behavior, like the brute hygiene behavior. The swarming can be understood as a, as a protective behavior. And then bees eviction. So if, if you have uh, diseased individuals, for the colonies, it's the best to throw them out. So the, the bees which we see in front of the hives no longer able to, to fly. It's good that they are out. I mean, they, they warn you, but for the colonies, it's good to throw them out. And then comes the brood compensation. So whenever there is a health problem in the hive, they lose bees, but at the same time, they can start this compensation motor and get a chance to replace those diseased bees with healthy bees. That's how it works. The same happens with varroa, and that, therefore we often do not recognize how many bees already got problems with varroa because the brute motor is going on until the last moment when they can't compensate any longer, and then the, the breakdown of the colonies come within a very short period. And then there's population level. We widely neglect this, but this is how it works in nature. There is density adjustment. If you get health problems, reduce the density of hives to reduce the exchange of parasites. And the lower population can build up again then when it, it develop better resistance traits. But there's this local adaptation, which we discussed in detail before, which plays such an important role in coping best with uh, the challenges, natural challenges of your place. And then there's genetic diversity. This plays an important role. And we discussed this with the uh, 20 drone-mated queens, that there's a lot of genetic diversity even within the single hive, but uh, it, it's also in the population. And this is how bees adapt. So we can have problems on, on these different levels. At the end, this is the unit which should survive, and this is probably the most important. OK, uh, if I summarize a little bit and, 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 and say, well, what we should be all aware, then first of all, I would like to say health does not mean at all the complete absence of any pathogens and parasites. No, this is not health. It's, it's absolutely normal that parasites and, and pathogens are present there. And they play an important role. And this is why the selection comes into the game. In fact, diseases are the main drivers of natural selection. Always improve your abilities in the face of your enemies. This is, this is what happens there in nature. And this is selection. And we have modern selection tools which are extremely effective. We can easily change the genetics of our bees nowadays, much better than 10, 20 years ago. And the technique is even further improving with modern genetic uh, 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 procedures. But we have to use it in the right way. So there's a high risk that we, that we are misled. And vitality and, and, and health of colonies should be the first priority in, in selection programs. This is my personal uh, feeling on this. And then <clears throat> most of the natural behaviors really serve to improve the vitality of hives. So the things which I have shown you, this undisturbed brood nest with the compact order, the inner structure in the hive, but then also these hygiene behaviors and, and swarming behavior and all this serves to strengthen the hive. So be careful with whatever you do on your hive, not to weaken the colonies. If you can leave them developing as far as possible on their own way, this is probably the best, the best situation. But we are beekeepers. I mean, we are not naturalists and just placing bees somewhere and observe if they can survive. I'm standing here for, for modern uh, beekeeping. And I'm happy to see that we have an increasing number of young people who make a living out of professional beekeeping. Great persons. Nice to see. And this is part of our culture. And so we are in the conflict that we use a natural organism 
And we want to manage it as natural-like as possible, to keep it healthy, to keep it vital, to make profit out of it, and at the same time to make sure that we don't stress them too much. So this, this has to be balanced. And it's a challenge, and, and we can improve things. We learn all the time. It's not, never a final point reached, but it's an interesting uh, task for us. Then furthermore, we can realize that all diseases, all the problems which we have, are not isolated. And in the hive, all diseases have natural antagonists. We often leave this out. We only see bees and there is varroa. Ah, no, there's also virus. Ah, okay. So that's it, three organisms. No, it's not like this. In each hive, we have more than 100 mites, mite species living naturally there. We have a wide range of fungi in hives. We have many, many bacteria. And it's just a few of the viruses which are really severe for bee colonies. We have much more in the hive. So it's, um, you have to come from a more ecological approach. So it's a living community which can stabilize each other. And there are interesting uh, antagonists which can be used also. The point is, at the moment, where we uh, oppose our colonies to, to pesticides, or where we use substances with a strong biological effect, and this is not only this uh, uh, synthetic var varrocytes, it's also formic acid, it's thymol, it's oxalic acid in the concentration which we use to fiber ore, have effect on the living community in a hive. So be very, very careful. Try to reduce it as far as possible, in general rule. And at the end, to answer what is health, health is representing a stable balance. That's it. A healthy colony is a colony which can successfully cope with all these challenges. And we can understand our, our successful beekeeping as supporting the bees in this natural expression of uh, protective behaviors. So my recommendations, what you can take home as a modern beekeeper, find suitable locations and keep as less colonies in one spot as possible. You find the compromise for yourself. Suitable locations have to have a good forage around, have to have a nice um, microclimatic conditions. At the end, the bees will tell you by themselves what is the best place. And even if you are just a small beekeeper, try to have two or three different apiaries and compare. And you will see in some places you always get problems with certain diseases or with swarming or whatever. Aggressive bees. And then just change the location. Because it's not longer the swarm which choose the place we are choosing for them, and they will tell us best what is correct. Undisturbed brood nest order. I don't have to deepen this any further, I think. Intensive reproduction, this is something which we can also learn from natural bee biology, as I said. Each healthy colony will build at least one swarm per year, so we get 100% plus of the population size in, in the upgrowing season. And you should do the same. So make nuclei, make artificial swarms, whatever, but use the reproductive capacities. And then it goes hand in hand with the consequent selection. So don't try to heal each highly susceptible colony which has chakra problems or which has a lot of varroa and so on. Kill them. Kill them. It sounds screwed. But it isn't. I mean, nature would kill them anyhow very soon. But you'd do a good job if you detect them in time and take them out of the game to protect the more healthy, better adapted ones. So this goes hand in hand with a good reproduction. And then as far as you can manage uh, no prophylactic use of therapeutics, regard thresholds. And we can do this with most of the diseases. Of course, uh, the main challenge nowadays is varroa. But even there, I observe that beekeepers are used to do 
prophylactic treatments with highly effective chemicals. They do not even know how many mites they are in. They treat all the hives of, of the apiary at the same time, regardless if there are colonies which have just low mite numbers and which could do very well by themselves. So we have to improve this. Okay, my time is nearly gone. The moderator <laughs> gives me a sign. I will be very, very fast now. <coughs> Just mention the points and you can read it later on in, in the internet. So prophylactic things are important. Hygiene, comp renewal, care for a good constitution out of colonies. Whenever it comes to brood diseases, the natural protection is brood interruption, built with work with swarms, artificial swarms, sh or shook swarms, as you like to tell them. And whenever you can, combine it with a trapping comp. I explained it yesterday, what it means in the context of a row. When it comes to problems with adult bees, see the natural mechanism. And this is a quick replacement of diseased elder bees. So this always happens when there is a good honey flow, or you can stimulate this with, with feeding, and it goes hand in hand with the swarming process. Again, if, if you have a brood interruption, bees are getting old, and then the old bees have to ha start with a new brood nest, and that's the way how they die out very soon, and then young bees come again. So this is a natural way of, of healing diseases of adult bees. And then most important is the selection on vitality and support antagonists. So, some examples, foul brood, you have problems with European foul brood. I have no experience with European foul brood because we are lucky in Germany not to have it. But we have American foul brood and what we do there, limit mobility. So like nature do, we don't have colony transfer in nature. This is what the veterinarian is, does in the first step and then destroy consequently the infected colonies and you may think about uh, sanitation by, by artificial swarms. So very natural methods. We don't use any antibiotics to heal these most infective diseases and general renewal hygiene in the hive. Check brood is very interesting because this is really a disease which is present everywhere. It's a fungi, which is, we find these balls everywhere. And if it occurs them with symptoms on the hive, it's very much a question of the constitution of the hive. So just the opposite to foul brood. Foul brood spores are so infective, when they are there, you will get symptoms. Chuck brood spores are always there. You get only symptoms if something is going wrong with the colony. So uh, this is why we can learn so much from it. Improves the general constitution. Something is wrong with your hives. They may be in the, in the wrong position, something may be wrong with the food, or whatever. And then stimulate hygiene behavior with a good flow, with, with feeding, uh, put them close together, not, not to wide nests and so on, and then maybe exchange the queen. And here, more than with other diseases, we could show that antagonists play an important role. There were colleagues developing another fungi which produces substances which can suppress this Ascosfera apis, the detergent of American uh, of, of chuck brood. And it's Bacillus subtilis, a bacteria which is present in most of our honey samples. It's there. And if this is well developing, then it gives some substance which successfully suppress a chuck brood. They had healing success up to 60%. So that was a clear effect, not high enough to get it registered as a drug. That was the initial idea. But very nice experiment to show the, the function. And we go in then with formic acid and lactic acid and all those things, and we destroy these natural communities. And then afterwards wondering why we get certain problems with certain new diseases which suddenly arise. OK, finally Varroa, but this is all explained. So, colony propagation, that you have good resources to select from. Brood interruption in the summer was well explained yesterday, I hope. Selection of resistant stock, most important, to have a long-term solution for the problem. And then the limited use of therapeutics. 
we cannot always avoid them, but we have nice methods to check for the infestation before we, before we treat, and that way also to select the ones who do better and to, to assure that they build the future of our beekeeping in, in Europe and in Britain. And that way, I wish you to learn a lifelong from the bees. Same for me. I know a few things, but I, I even notice that I, uh, there's much more to learn. And that is why I really enjoy to come here. Thanks to Roger once again at the end of the, of these three fascinating days. I was so much impressed for how you organize this, this honey show, how many people come here, and so many individual discussions. So I, I learned a lot and I go home with uh, many new ideas in my head. So thank you very much for, for the meeting and all the best for your beekeeping future. When you suggest we kill the weak colonies, are you suggesting we kill the whole colony, or given that it's the queen that produces all of those, are we okay just replacing the queen? Yeah. It depends very much on the situation. Um, uh, yeah. Check first why is this colony weak, so, and, and give them a chance. I mean, weak colonies can still well develop. You have to get a clearer picture of what, what is the reason behind. And if you have uh, colonies which are really infected, then often it's best to take out the whole colony. Uh, still, if it's just something going wrong, but there is a chance to, to renew the colony, then queen exchange can be, a very good, can be a very good choice and take then offspring queens from more resistant stock. So that's the way then. Can I just ask your opinion? Jürgen Tortz has suggested that queens on their mating flights may be accompanied by foragers because it always seems a weak point, as you suggested yourself, in the whole mating mm. scheme of things. Do you have any views on that idea? Mm. Has anyone else sort of um, tried to illustrate that it actually is so? Uh, there's nothing to find about this in the scientific literature. So I, I think it's wrong and also for my personal investigations. We did a little of work on, on uh, queen mating behavior in torn congregation. I can't uh, approve this, that really workers are comparing. It's, it's the opposite. Um, I did some research together with Professor Menzel, who has this radar technology, and, and we understand better now how queens orientate. And the fact is they, they have uh, short orientation flights at their first flights, three, four flights maybe, which last just for uh, seconds or maybe uh, three, four minutes longest. And that's how they recognize the close surrounding of the hive. And then afterwards, they immediately start for long distance flights. So once they, they recognize their position, they can navigate with the, with the uh, uh, sky uh, compass, let me say, and they find the way back from a region where they have never been before, three, four, five kilometers far away from, from the hive, they find back to the small region which they noticed which they know is the place of the hive, and then they return. So they don't depend on any worker attendance in, the, in this. OK. On one of your studies, you mentioned hives were put 70 meters apart from each other for mm -hmm. density. Um, what is the optimum density for hives? Mm. This study was, was done by the colleagues in, in North America, Tom Seeley and his group. So. Uh, they work with the 70 meters, and it was surprising to see that already 70 meters makes such a difference. Because what we know from the natural swarming behavior is that uh, swarms prefer distances about 500, 700, 900 meters. So 700, I think, is the average of what is recorded so far. And this reflects the natural distribution in a, in a bee population. At the end, it depends very much on the, on the resources. So if you are in a region where there is rich nectar and pollen resources, there will be a higher density than in, in regions where there is a desert. That, that's for sure. So it's always about the adaptation. But these 700 meters gives you an idea of probably ideal distance uh, for colonies. Yeah.